For every great metal band, there are albums that define their sound. Some bands gained their style and talent over time, while others blew out of the gate and had a debut that launched careers. Metal owes a lot to some of these albums, and this video looks at the top 10 best debut metal albums. A month ago, I posted the top 10 best debut rock albums video. A link to that is in the video description and on the YouTube card. I point that out because you may not see your favorite debut on this list, but you might see it over on that video. Keep in mind, this is just sorting and ranking through opinions, not to be taken that seriously. Rules for the list. I'm talking about full LPs, no EPs. Also not going into adjacent genres like industrial and punk. So something like Nine Inch Nails Pretty Hate Machine won't be on here as much as I love it. Solo artists are fine, but no super groups. Please like and subscribe on this video. It helps a ton. You know how these videos work. Let's get to it. There are many bands who try to combine several metal styles while also making the sound their own. Many of those bands, in my opinion, cannot come close to matching what the Dillinger Escape Plan created in 1999. Calculating Infinity was so much more advanced for its time in 99 than most metal bands could even grasp, let alone new fans trying to understand every facet of such technical aggression. Describing Calculating Infinity and the Dillinger Escape Plan is not easy to do in one sentence. One of the true original math core style albums before that term had a proper definition, this was controlled chaos with endless intensity. As a quick listen, it sounds horrific. When you sit and listen to just how much it has, everything fits together. There were many lineup changes over the course of the Dillinger Escape Plan, and everyone was going to have their favorite singer or guitarist, or one-time singer, but Dimitri deserves a lot more credit for what he did, along with Ben Wyman, who was a creative genius with some of the guitar skills shown on Calculating Infinity. This took the Dillinger Escape Plan from underground to in a class of their own, as experimental as it is heavy. It's a side of extreme music that should not have been as much of a standout in 99, but the Dillinger Escape Plan were too talented to be kept silent. This was a monstrous debut. In the early 2000s, when new metal and post grunge were the biggest thing in heavy music, a group in Georgia were not going to change up their playing style. Mastodon has made bold steps in metal through combining a stoner metal groove through Prague, but those two styles did not coincide as well until Mastodon's first full LP, Remission, came out. Since then, it only proved their aggression and creativity. On paper, this sounds like a mess. A band where every member sings and they're playing wild signatures on top of each other and the songs are meant to be connected, but when you finally hear the crushing drumming from Brand Daler, and you hear the many grooves and thick guitars and bass, you understand instantly. This was actually one of the few Mastodon albums that was not a full concept, rather it just had an overrunning theme. It was March of the Fire Ants that intrigued everyone on first listen. If anything, just for curiosity to hear more. That's what Mastodon does though. They hook you in and drag you down the rabbit hole. Remission is sludge and stoner metal personified, from opening with a Tyrannosaurus roar all the way to a massive instrumental closing. Mastodon chose chaotic good for a role on this album, and the campaign led to many adventures, while the origin of Remission being a fantastic starting point. In the beginning of the 2010s, we heard the ritual that would eventually have Tobias Forge and a revolving door of nameless schools play arenas across the world. Ghost's debut, Opus Eponymous, was part throwback to 70s and 80s metal, part mystery with shrouding identities. An atmosphere of classic metal made modern, with lyrics about Satan while being as satanic as a spirit Halloween store. Technically performed by only three people and recorded produced in a basement studio, Opus Eponymous started something gargantuan for Ghost. The music was recorded with only one guitar and played through an orange thunder verb with backed up gain to get that throwback 70s sound. With limited means, Ghost got creative and it paid off. Opus Eponymous is dripping with identity and the music written has that tone that Ghost could build and grow from. From haunting organ notes to huge riffs, this album was the sound that was missing in heavy music for a long time, up until 2010. As Ghost has become more divisive among the current fan base, one opinion that isn't a big argument is that the debut LP is fantastic. Opus Eponymous was and still is a great introduction for the legend of the mini Papa Emeritus's Emeriti? It's a great introduction to Ghost, and it's still worth revisiting. What happens when you were fired from the first true metal band ever? You go out and make one of the most memorable solo albums ever. Not just for metal, but music in general. Ozzy Osbourne proved he wasn't done in 1980 with Blizzard of Oz. It was part rebuttal to Black Sabbath after getting the boots, and part defiance to everyone saying he was too messed up to continue with music in any form. 1980 Ozzy Osbourne was the point where Ozzy's wild side was infamous around the world. Black Sabbath had to get rid of him. The bright side of this, however, is that it helped Ozzy prove to himself that he could keep going. 
he started working with promising young guitarist Randy Rhodes and made the best type of Blizzard ever. The opening notes of Crazy Train took the album to charting success even without good radio play at the time. Hearing Mr. Crowley with the great riffs from Randy Rhodes was massive and it made Ozzy Osbourne a megastar over time while not needing Black Sabbath to help keep him upright. Osborne said in his autobiography that at the time, he did feel he was in direct competition with Black Sabbath. Regardless of the history and chaotic life events of Ozzy's career, this album held up regardless of any internally viewed competition. Prince of Darkness kept making metal, even if he had to do it under his own name. When Ronnie James Dio took the mic for Black Sabbath, it was a massive statement. And when he made his solo album, Holy Diver, he proved he could stand out with his own band under his own name. The metal world was introduced to Holy Diver in 1983, and from that point on, Ronnie James Dio went from metal icon to full-on music legend in general. Holy Diver was a true metalhead's album in the best way. In the 80s, when different types of metal were breaking out from thrash to glam, Dio kept it heavy and held everyone's respect. Holy Diver rekindled the love for many of the classic metal names from Sabbath to Ozzy, and naturally Ronnie James Dio with his own band. Do you love Dark Towers, Wizards, and Mythical Wars in your metal? Then you need to be thanking Dio and Holy Diver for truly making that such a major feature. Dio said in an old interview, when I became a songwriter, I thought what better thing to do than do what no one else is doing, to tell fantasy tales. Smartest thing I ever did. Holy Diver was meticulously made with band members chosen to help make that perfect execution. Vinny, Jimmy Bain, and Vivian Campbell all were brilliant choices and crafted the highest quality you could have made at the time, and arguably even today. It's years later, roughly four decades, and few people could even try to match Roddy James Dio's voice. By 1993, people already had a small introduction to Maynard James Keating of features with Rage Against the Machine and Green Jello. And the OPD EP was the appetizer, but the full album debut undertow was what made Tool a huge deal from that point on. This was the young, randomly immature, haunting, and impossibly technical and skilled band. Tool made Fanatics upon first listen of Undertow. Fanatics is a fair way to describe the longtime Tool fans, and for good reason. Undertow was different from the grunge explosion and helped add longevity to metal with something visceral and filled with imagery in the music. Maynard's voice along with the incredible guitar solo from Adam Jones created something massive for what started as a small section of fans that quickly became enormous. From hearing Sober and seeing that stop motion video, all the way to Henry Rollins saying he has to confront you, Tool made not just an album, but an experience, and people still go back to that one today. Undertow remains many Tool fans' favorite album from the group, as well as being a classic stand-up from the 90s. As wild as the 90s got with heavy music, Maynard James Keaton said, let me show you how wild works, and Tool did. Undertow still holds up for that era of Tool, and it inspired many other groups. There will be an argument as to whether this is Slipknot's actual debut or the band did release Mate, Feed, Kill, Repeat with original singer Anders and before the lineup was solidified. There were only a thousand copies distributed, while the Slipknot self-titled album made a band a household name and went platinum in several countries. Slipknot self-titled was as big of a debut as possible for any metal band. When people saw the image of Slipknot for the first time, I think many metal elitists did not give Slipknot any time of day, and non-metal fans either were terrified or thought it was a joke. The music proved the band. From the day wait and Bleed hit airwaves and was featured in movie soundtracks, fans started flocking in. Slipknot's live shows and the self-titled True Debut kept those fans for decades. So many groups source Slipknot as inspiration and idols in metal due to writing, playing, live shows, commitment, you name it. Slipknot's self-titled is the reason it's worth being called a maggot. This is an album that technically took new metal into much heavier and darker territory as well. While Slipknot would evolve in sound over the years, the debut is still appreciated for what it accomplished in 19 1999, and all the naysayers and metal purists would eventually be proved wrong that Slipknot were a mask-wearing gimmicky flash in the pan. The talent shined. Before Bruce Dickinson was in front of the legendary Iron Maiden, it was Paul D. and Steve Harris working together to form one of the greatest heavy metal bands ever. 1980's self-titled debut opened the metal gates from England, and we've all been running free ever since. Over 40 years since Iron Maiden's album was released, and we still look back at how much an album like this launched for metal. Most members of Iron Maiden, including past and current, did not like this album. They didn't like the production, the design, they didn't like the tone or songwriting, and when it was released in 1980, they were in the minority because the 
the album was almost completely praised from day one. The evolution of Iron Maiden is a story in itself, but the first release from the band showed just how much Steve Harris was capable of writing alongside a world-class guitarist like Dave Murray and a range of other guitarists to follow. From instrumentals to Phantom of the Opera, Harris proved his creativity. He also proves that basses can be the brains of a band. It's true that you don't hear many Iron Maiden fans or metalheads say the self-titled is their favorite Iron Maiden album. You also hear the same people tribute just how much came out of 1980 with this metal sanctuary. British heavy metal is sharp, and the only people that don't like it are the people that made this album. That's oddly metal in a way. Not putting Kill 'Em All on this list would have been a true injustice to thrash, 80s metal, and the music world in general. Not to mention the overly sensitive Metallica diehards would have had a hissy fit. I love this album though, so Kill 'Em All is easy to put high on the best metal debuts. Metallica went from the garage to the main stage in quick fashion. When you hear Kill 'Em All, you know why. Some of the best metal albums ever had a true raw recording process with minimal production value. Kill 'Em All proves it can happen even on a modest budget. Metallica was launched into the spotlight. The songwriting became infamous due to the Dave Mustaine situation, and Thrash now revolved around a young Bay Area group. Along with masterful covers Seek and Destroy and Whiplash, this album became a classic. Shredding and long metal tracks with an attitude took the stage, Cliff Burton became a bass god, and James Hetfield's Yeah! became the most quoted lyric of all time. Think about it. A faster playing technique and a lot of shouting made the perfect format for Thrash to break out in the United States. It may not be the most celebrated Metallica album or even close to the band's best output in the 80s, but Kill 'Em All was proof at the time that any band can make it big right from the start. Just like this list, metal itself would not exist without the foundation that Black Sabbath laid in 1970. Recorded in less than a day, a testament to the band's skill, Tony Iommi created something unique at the start of the decade. Beatlemania was over, bigger rock bands were emerging, and when Tony found Ozzy Osbourne, rock would not be enough. Metal had to become its own separate world. In that 12-hour recording period, the self-titled Black Sabbath album was proof that you can get to work with great company and make something legendary in fast order. The opening minute of the title track has the perfect ominous this build to what would be the base for multiple musicians, future bands, and how metal would grow from 1970 onward. This is an album that could feature a song about Gandalf and a song from the perspective of Satan and make them belong together. The dark imagery and the fantastical world that many metal bands indulge in both have roots toward Black Sabbath's debut. Then take into account just how good Iommi, Butler, and Ward were. You hear each member's presence in their playing through the album, all while Ozzy Osbourne became royalty with his performance. This is an album that defined a band, defined a genre, and horrified every Christian mother in the world. That makes it a masterpiece. There are many reasons why, over 50 years later, Black Sabbath the album is still pointed to as a crucial part of music history, not just heavy music history. Black Sabbath the album has a legacy that's going to outlive all of us and every fan of music that won't match something this classic. And that was a look at the top 10 best debut metal albums. What did you think was the best debut metal album? Leave a comment, let everyone know. Big thanks to my YouTube members and patrons, and special thanks to Chris Doman, Clark Walden, and Dom Noble. You can have a say at upcoming videos, get weekly music playlists, and see videos early by supporting Rocked on Patreon and through YouTube memberships. Click the join button below or the link in the video description to help the channel. Please subscribe and ring the bell to get notified of upcoming videos and keep up to date with Rocked on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Remember that you can check out the, what I feel are the top 10 best debut rock albums in the YouTube card and the video description as well. Let me know what you think over there on that video too.